Uh, who was the judge? Edmund. Um, what's that? Edmund. Edmund. What is his name? Edmund. 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 And Shal. Shalmar. Who? Shalmar. Shalmar. All right. So actually, the oppressor was Elgon, and the judge was Ehud. What should we learn from God's use of Ehud, a man of the Remember, he had his, uh, couldn't use his left hand. God can use anybody. Okay. In spite of? Yeah. In spite of? In spite of? In spite of? In spite of? Yeah. All right. Yes. He might even use the weakness as part of his plan, right? What does Shamgar's use of an ox goad to kill 600 Philistines say about the need for resources to serve God? Okay. It doesn't necessarily need our resources, does it? He only needs our obedience. Okay. Introduction. I was going to do this uh, example here, and I didn't have a big enough knife for it. Well, I did have a big knife, but I didn't want to bring it to church for people to ask questions. But anyway, the, the illustration is if I gave somebody in here, two people, an apple, and I asked you to hold it like this. And the other person had a knife, and I wanted them to cut it in half. How many of you would be okay with that? For them to just take the knife and slice it in your hands? Depends on how hot you're going to be. I don't know how big your apple is. I think in practice, uh, I don't think anybody in here would accept the fact that someone's going to take a knife and hack at your hands, even though they didn't have it. Right? I mean, so it's going to be my Well, I'm just saying, if you volunteer, well, if you had the knife, right, you'd be all right with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't, uh, I was going to bring my samurai sword in for that, but you know what? I'll just, I'll just pass it. <laughs> should, I should have fired it. Uh, so why would anybody refuse this? What's the problem? Do we not believe that the task can be accomplished, or do we not have that faith in the plan? Accidents happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't have confidence in the plan, we aren't anxious to participate, right? I mean, nobody wants to. Everybody's always thinking of the outcome. But uh, when it comes to God giving this instruction to us, we also say the same thing to Him. Now, I know what the outcome is going to be, and I don't really trust that you're going to provide uh, a resolution. But we know God always provides a resolution, He always has a way out, and He always has the perfect plan. Technology, I'm going to work in here in a second. You have. You have. Big idea for today, because God always has a perfect plan, we should make ourselves available for His service and take action when He calls. In our study of the third cycle on the God's perfect plan, uh, God's perfect plan is described as we draw encouragement from those who choose to participate. Number one, back to disobedience. Uh, we're in Judges 4. This is the story of Deborah, one of the uh, only female judges of Israel. Chapter 4 tells the story of the third cycle. Uh, I think in your homework it told you to read chapter 5 of Minecraft. More fun. Okay. Chapter 5 is basically a song that they sang about the deliverance. Um, we can, we're not going to really go into that, but we can reference it for uh, notes and hints of what happened during the battle that wasn't actually uh, described in chapter 4. So keep that as a side note. We might reference it, but we're not going to go into that. Uh, chapter 5 is uh, celebratory. It is common for the Jewish people to celebrate uh, special occasions in this way. But, uh, I've noticed there's. I tried reading that in the song version, like you know, you sing to yourself in the head, but I couldn't get the rhythm out. It did not flow very well, so I don't know if that was 100% what they were singing or, or what the what the music they were using. Might be a different translation. I couldn't get it to work. Some say that you read some other uh, works is that that was also a poem. Yeah. 
No, I mean songbird. She sang it as a songbird, but uh, it was actually a poem, I guess. Like King David and his songs. Yeah. After he had died, he read a familiar refrain about Israel. Again, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. This happened after 80 years. Oh, I mean, it again. I mean, we just never emphasize enough. There we go again. Yeah. Uh, that's that's what we're doing. <laughs> in and out, in and out. The cycle continues. Uh, they had 80 years of rest, which is pretty long. That was the longest period recorded in the Book of Judges for Israel. Uh, instead of peace drawing Israel nearer to God, apparently it uh, once again brought about spiritual decline. And then if you go back to when you look at uh, the period of rest in between the judges, we think of the judges, a person who comes in and is a accountability uh, <coughs> uh, partner. When the accountability partner goes away, over time, we start reverting again. And this is, again, the cycle, as Dan said, just keep going and going and going. Again, they did evil after the judge is removed. Uh, 80 years was the longest rest period, uh, and they go back to the climate. This represents failure. This represented failure seems to be the most common fact in history of the recorded the judges. But before we judge too quickly, think about this. We should realize that it would also be a common fact if somebody wrote about our life history. About starting from when you were born up until the time you were dead, how many times you were acting just like Israel, going to God only when you needed Him. <coughs> Not saying that's everybody, but we, we all have a tendency for that. Who was the oppressor in this power in chapter 4? Uh, David. Hmm? David. 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 Canaan introduced or included several uh, uh, people groups, Philistines, the Amalites, and Amalekites. Amalekites, there we go. And the Amorites, who uh, each had a ruler. David was the little the high lord of king of Hazor. He also was king of Canaan, probably because he was the head of the Confederacy of Kings within the land of Canaan. Uh, the general of this army was, uh, the general of his army was Sisera. Because Sisera is mentioned so often, we can assume that he was the oppressor. To Israel. Uh, what difference do you see in the oppression described in verse 3 compared to the other two cycles? So somebody go ahead and read verse 3, uh, chapter 4 for me, please. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 shirts of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Okay. What is the difference there between the uh, the other cycles that we talked about? Okay, so yes, it was a much harsher oppression. Uh, during the other two aggressions, Israel served a foreign king. They were just kind of underneath a king. But this guy, uh, Sisera, harshly punished them uh, during this time. Uh, this was, uh, let's look at the things that made the oppression worse. It lasted 20 years. 20 years of harsh oppression. I don't know, that sounds like a long time. I'm only 39. I can't imagine almost all of my life being under oppression. Uh, it was a local enemy. Uh, they had more means and opportunities to be mistreated and punish Israel. The enemy was native to the land that had been invaded by Israel. It was a native enemy. Hazard had, Hazard had been conquered and burned by Joshua in Joshua 11. They had rebuilt and had extra hatred for the Jews for <coughs> their cruelty. Uh, in Genesis 9.25, the Canaanites, descendants of Ham, were cursed through the servants of Israel, descendants of Shem. Israel now being oppressed by the people who were supposed to be their servants because they had disobeyed God by not driving them. All of your life. So let's look at uh, verse 6 through 8 in chapter 5. This gives us a hint of what life is like during the time. So I'll just jump over the chapter. The Bible's on next, there's a chapter on next page. And I'm going to read 6 and 8 here real quick. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anna, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, and the travelers walked along the highway. The village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods, then there was war in the gates. 
Now a shield, a spear, or now a shield, or not a shield or spear, was seen among forty thousand in Israel. So we read that. What, what's going on here? All right. We have no commerce. It was a safe. It was safe to use the highways to conduct business at the time. Uh, there was no traveling. People had to sneak along the byways to get somewhere. There was no farming. No much life ceased. That means that it wasn't safe to be out in the country for farming. There was no peace. There was war in the gates. There was no weapons. Whether they were disarmed or had neglected the art of war, Israel had nothing to fight with. Interesting. We were just talking about that in uh, two classes ago where God was forming Israel's nation to fight war. He was trying to get them to understand what war was. And then we come over to you know chapter four here and we're back to, they had nothing to fight with. Well, what were they doing? I don't know. They weren't following God. The oppression they was certainly worse. The oppression was certainly worse than the previous two. Uh, but this was the Old Testament, right? Do you think the New Testament believers can expect strange or stronger forms of chastisement from the land if they continue to reject God's grace? Well, they won't be expecting the same, right? Well, then why is that? Because God doesn't change. No, that's right. The so God of the Old Testament yeah. is. Got it today. Nothing's changed. Um, why? I, I know you just mentioned that, but why else? Why else? Why? Why else? Oh, why else would it? Okay. Uh, the, the, we're talking about the Old Testament here. Uh, why do you think New Testament believers can expect strong forms of chastisement from the Lord if they continue to reject it? Well, we got to complete the work. Use the bills, maybe. We don't have excuses, right? All right. Let's turn over to Hebrews 12. Yeah. Chapter 12, verse 6. Chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. I say that right? Scourges every son. Yeah, every son. And so you, you don't think that we can just continue this cycle forever because we will get deliverance when we we'll cry out to God. If anyone in their right mind would be okay with continually going through punishment, we should also pay attention to the two other New Testament passages, Matthew 18, which teaches that if sin isn't resolved after the three step process, we should remove the brother from our fellowship. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul instructs the church, regardless of the immoral sin of a brother, he tells them to deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. We can expect stronger forms of chastisement from God and continued sin, and eventually the cycle ends with the brother being cast out of the world for his destruction, so that further damage to the church is prevented. We can look at that as the same as when God told the Israelites to invade and take away the, the, the enemy. He didn't want. He wanted them to completely destroy them because he didn't want their uh, godlessness to be led into Israel over time. And that's basically what happened. Uh, and we can we can see that here uh, as far as like the church now. Uh, and in Matthew 18, it teaches that you know we have a process. If somebody is a blatant sinner and is not repentant of that sin, we go to them uh, three times. Uh, if the sin isn't resolved, why would we keep if the person that's sinning does not want to change or repent to God and continues to want to come to church, why would we allow that? What's that going to do to the rest of the people here? It's going to be a poison, right? So there's 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 a process here that we can relate back in the Old Testament. All right, despair. Despair. As usual, Israel eventually cried out to God for help. Doesn't appear they cried out for forgiveness, though, or relief from suffering. If that had truly, if they had truly repented, God would not only have delivered them from physical slavery, but would have liberated them from spiritual bondage. Um, from the book, be available to ask God for comfort and not cleansing 
is only to sow seeds of selfishness that will eventually produce another bitter harvest. Who's our deliverer in chapter 4? Deborah. Deborah's, uh, Deborah was Israel's fourth judge. The fact that Deborah was a woman was actually a uh, humiliation for the Jews because they lived in a male dominated society that wanted only sure male leadership. So I can imagine that that was their, their pill to swallow. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 3.12 as for my people, children, and their oppressors, and women who ruled over them. When God made Israel a woman judge, he was treating them like children, which is exactly where they were spiritually. So let's look at Deborah's characteristics. Who was she? I just see her, but I see her, but a prophetess. You're right. You're right. She was initially acquainted with God and received divine knowledge by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. She also had a gift of wisdom. She was accessible. In verse 5, it says that she made herself available to the children of Israel. Instead of, no, I'm sorry, yes. Next one. She's a woman of action. In verse 6, she sent for Barak to tell him that God had told her with the intent of making it happen. In verse 14, she encourages Barak. To get up and go to battle. She supported her people. In verse 8, Barak asked her to go with him. She agreed, demonstrating she's willing to do what was asked of her. Nice that people are writing small stories. She's also devoted to her people. In 5.7, she refers to herself as Mother of Israel. She cared deeply for her people. She was a prophetess and judge, but thought of herself as a mother to her people. <clears throat> as we read through uh, chapter 4 here, uh, a lot of stuff is playing out here between her and Barak, which is, uh, which is kind of interesting. I had to read chapter 4, I'm not going to lie, I had to read this probably six or seven times. Uh, because of all the names being thrown around and who's who and where's what, um, I had a hard time just initially reading it, understanding what was going on with just the names. So I don't know if anybody else experienced that, but I actually had to write it out and then put like lines and like she's here, he's here, this is the enemy. So it was a little bit confusing for me, but I got it. I figured it out. I figured it out. It's God's perfect plan. That's all we need to know. Deborah is close and connected to Barrett for general. Being a woman, she didn't directly carry out military leadership. She was asked to assemble an army and fight Syria, Sisera. Barak agreed conditionally as a result. He was not allowed to honor. He was not allowed the honor of defeating Sisera himself. So what it means here when he's Barak agreed conditionally, we read in uh, <coughs> 7 and 8. And, again, uh, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army. With his chariots and, and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. And Barak said to her, "This is Barak talking to Deborah. I will, or if you go, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go." God had commanded uh, Barak, and he put a condition on that. This wasn't a command for him to go and. Yeah, Deborah to go with him. It was, this is your command to go and do this. And he said, well, I'll go if you go. She went anyway, but her, her, her sentence to him was, you, this won't be given to you. And if we continue reading, so she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of the woman. And Deborah arose and went there to Kedesh. Now, I, I'm guessing that because of the state of Israel's army, since they had no weapons, it was really kind of didn't really have a lot. I'm sure he was probably second guessing himself and God. Uh, shouldn't do that, but he, he did, and he just wanted her to go with him because um, yeah, I was scared. I don't think that he. I think he just felt maybe that she was in contact with God, and the closer she was to him, the closer God would be to him and help him. 
There you go. That too, and I don't think he trusted, he completely trusted that God was going to, was really going to help him. He didn't have, he didn't have 100% faith in God. Right, if he would, he would have just went there and did what God told him instead of going to her. Okay. To ask God for comfort and not cleansing, or yeah, cleansing is only just, oh, that was the book. Sorry. Uh, so let's look at the church's plan. Ten through twenty-four. Can I have somebody read chapter four, ten through twenty-four, please? <clears throat> and Mary called Zebulun and. Till to uh, Kadesh and went up, and he he went up with ten thousand men under his command. And Deborah went with him. Now Heber, a Canaanite of the children of Boaz, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Canaanites and pitched his tent near the Tamath Terabith tree at Zanaman, which is beside Kadesh, and he. And he, they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinam, had come up to Mount Tabor. To Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him, from <laughs> Hashereth, yeah, Hashereth, and, and, and the river, to the river Kirshan. <laughs> Then Deborah said to Barak, up, up, for this day is the day in which the Lord has delivered the sister into your hands. He, has not the Lord gone and before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed sister and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And sister, uh, oh, alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army of the as far as Hashereth and I'm sorry, you know, the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to to the tent of Jael, the wife of the of Eber the Kenite, where there was no peace between Jaden king of Hazar and the house of Hebrus, the Canaanite, even. And Jael went out to meet Sister and uh, said to him, Turn away, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the door of the tent, and if any man comes in corners of you, and say, Is there any man here? You shall say no. And Jael, uh, Hebrew's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and went softly to him, and drove the peg into his temple, and it went down into the ground, where he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And then as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to, the, to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera, dead with the peg in his temple. So on the day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of the Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Okay, let's break this down. What, what's happening here? Uh, Barak assembled the army with men from Nat, uh, Tale and Zebulun. In chapter 5, we find that Ish, uh, Ishtar, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh went, uh, also responded to the call with him. Four tribes that were called upon did not volunteer Reuben, Manasseh, East Dan, and Asher. All those who fought. Are, are those who did not, or who weren't part of God's perfect plan. So Cicero was tipped off about the assembling of the army in Heber. 
Uh, he had left his, his relatives in Judah and his north. It's hard to know why, but God directed it. Again, this is God's perfect plan. If uh, Barak would just have done what he was initially told, all of this still would have played out regardless of the still would have had victory. Uh, we may not always understand why God leads us somewhere, uh, but we have a purpose, and sometimes we are able to see it, and we are able to see it until later. So Heber was a space, or was a place with Jabin, and probably just trying to make the best of the situation, he Hang in, hang in there. What number are we on? Perfect plan? Five. Uh, he certainly didn't expect this was a win before. Okay, we know that. So next, God's plan starts to make sense to us. Uh, the most likely took place during the dry season. Uh, this is where the, the uh, guys went down with the, the iron chariots. Uh, since you probably didn't have uh, he probably didn't, wouldn't have taken his chariots into the plains if it were muddy and flooding. Um, from verse, or from chapter 5, 21, we can, like I said, remember 5 has uh, some information in it that 4 does not contain. In uh, 5, 21, we know that God sent a fierce rainstorm that flooded the, the Kishon River and turned the battlefield into a sea of mud. So that, that directed them out of there. So that also confused the enemy troops. The word for rather in verse 15 means confused or thrown into panic. This confusion may have aided uh, by the fact that the Canaanites got Baal was supposed to be the god of the storms. So right then and there, they, they felt that Baal uh, deserted them. Because why would, uh, why would Baal do that to them? But it was all part of God's perfect plan. What else did we see that, if you remember back in history? What? The chariots getting... Oh, yeah, Moses. Let's see. Yeah. All right, Moses. Yeah, Moses. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's not the right one. Uh, there's one there. Uh, Sisera fled the battle. He left. He saw those men dying, he beat his foot, and he beat out of there. Uh, he came to the tent of jail, if you remember. Uh, jail was. I don't know what verse was that in? Uh, Hebrew. Okay, uh, verse 11 here. Now, Hebrew the Kenite, the children of Hoab, Hoba, the father-in-law of Moses had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent in the Arabenth tree at Zanai, um, which is based in Kesh. So Heber was neither for the Canaanites or against the Israelites. He was kind of a neutral. Um, and they both knew that, so he wasn't an enemy to either of them. So he, he kind of set himself aside from the battle uh, with his family, and that's kind of where this comes in. Uh, after his sister fled, he went to that place, he came to the tent of Jail's, uh, jail keeper's wife, and sought rest and protection. Now, he obviously did that because, again, he knew that there, he wasn't an enemy uh, to the Canaanites. So he, he, he sought refuge there. Uh, jail gave him a drink, covered him up so he could sleep, and then nailed his head into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> So, this was all part of God's perfect plan. Right? <laughs> exactly. Right? There was it. Yes, it was. How could Jael deceive Sisera and kill him, yet be commended by the Lord for her actions? She kept her faith and she followed uh, Israel. Um, beliefs. She didn't. She, she wasn't happy with the outcome. She, didn't, she took sides with Israel, basically. And her husband did. He stayed well, he kind of wasn't even mentioned in there. But what's interesting about this uh, this interaction between Cicero and the jail, uh, he he's considered a guest at this point, right? He goes to their, their tent. Uh, at this point, he's considered a guest, but yet he's demanding that she risk her life to say that he's not there. And he demands drink. And the custom of that day, uh, visitors didn't do that. If you were a guest in, in somebody's house, you were a guest. You did not demand or make demands for anything. Uh, but he obviously did. So, and she she gave him what with him. He asked for water and she gave him milk. Was there any significance to that? Yeah. Uh, was there any significance to that? Uh, 
I couldn't find it. I don't know if anybody else says anything on that. If they read it and known. I know a lot of times the water wasn't good. Um, uh, the milk would be upgrade. I know the milk was a, a customary drink at the time. Right. Um, I mean, it wasn't like milk today. It was kind of like a. Uh, I think the Arabs still drink today. It's a. Uh, it's almost like a curdled, like yogurt. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. I think it's interesting since you opened the jug. Like you went to the river and got some milk. Yes, well, I just read that, that it was, it was actually, she was paying him honor because it was a higher drink than water. Okay. But it was also a drink that was of comfort. And since he felt honored and comforted, he felt safe enough to go and fall into this deep sleep, which was in his demise. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Those were all of something that's not going to sleep. I never had any sleep. Okay, so in chapter 5, verse 24 through 27, here we go. Okay. 25. Most blessed among women is Jacob, the wife of Heber the Kenneth. Blessed is she among women, intent, intense. He asked for water, she gave milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand out with the tent peg, uh, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She pounded the Cicero, uh, she pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. At his feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet he sank, he fell. When he sank, there he fell dead. I think that's the one that's related to the at her feet, when well, he's already laying there, he's just laying there. I, I just, you questioned that a little bit when I. I think what they mean is that when he fell, he was falling asleep at her feet. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But that were song praise jail, but giving a drink and covering someone was not the strongest pleasure protection possible, so she received it. The cats were at peace with Jaden, so, uh, so she broke a treaty. Think about it that way too. She, they were supposed to be at peace, and then she killed her, her, her general. She gave the impression that she would guard the door after broke her promise to kill the defenseless man, but she was a murderer. You must understand the differences in the Old Testament versus the New Testament to reconcile this. In the Old Testament, Israel was often the sword of God. Hold on, let's go through these first. Uh, perfect plan. Send the army and took of the enemy. Here's the rainstorm. And we're going to write that down. The Old Testament, Israel was often uh, the sword of God. Literally, it was God's will that Israel be delivered from this oppression. In verse 15, <coughs> the Lord routed the army by the edge of the sword. In verse 16, not a man was left. Cicero was the leader of the army that God was destroying. This was war and uh, this was war, and a courageous woman stepped up, being neutral and understanding with God's people. Does this apply to New Testament believers? Are we justified in killing abortion doctors? Doing something that's not uh, that's, that's wrong, right? No, we live under a new covenant. Let's read Romans 13, 1 through 2. Can we get there? Go ahead and read Romans 13, 1 through 2. Everyone must submit himself to his own authority, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authority that exists has been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Uh, all right, interesting. You're to submit, right? We're not the sword of God. We cannot just kill anyone who is opposed to God. Uh, we need to submit to authority that is above us, whether that be government, police, uh, uh, whatever it may be. We've got to pay our taxes. We can't just not do that because we don't feel like it. Uh, we have to obey laws. We can't just not obey laws because we don't feel like it. This is stuff that we have to submit. Now, when it comes down to it's like that double-edged sword kind of action there. Uh, but 
the government was forcing us to, you know, close our churches and not do that, obviously, I mean, there's, you can't stop worshiping God. That's, that's a direct violation of what we believe. Uh, so, there's some leeway there. But when it comes to just regular things that the government and, and, and hierarchy above us, outside of God, we're supposed to submit those. And that is, they lost. Uh, and we, we just can't just go so peacefully to the opposed to God's success. Uh, all of these events were a perfect part of God's plan. We can trust that God's perfect plan uh, was, uh, is to be understood, and all of it because of His plan. Our volunteer, our two volunteers, uh, if I had them, uh, would have seen this. They could have just trusted the plan, and the apple would be cut in half. So there's always a chance that somebody's going to miss it. But you wouldn't trust me, you trust God. God's perfect plan is the first part of our big idea. The last part is being able to take action when called by God. So, what's our conclusion today? If we have to, if we were to compare to this story of our time, we can identify many of the characteristics today. Dean Jaden would be Satan, directing the oppression of God's people. Sisera could be the busyness that keeps us from reading God's word and being involved in ministry. The grudge that we hold against the fellow Christians, which uh, prevents us from having the right relationship with God. The producers, uh, like Hugh Hefner and Larry Flint, were the products of the uh, product lines, uh, sorry, whose product lines people into sexual immorality. It doesn't appear uh, they cried out for forgiveness, I'm talking about Israel, or sins, but the relief from suffering. If they had truly, uh, sorry about that, my paper fell on my step. I knew I didn't read that right. Uh, number four, the life threatening illness is uh, in a loved one that causes us to doubt God's goodness and love. Uh, these are some of the uh, scenarios that we can kind of relate with today's, today's life. Uh, what character is this? Are we the tribe who didn't volunteer for the fight? The shirkers who uh, stood on the sideline and did nothing? Are we Barrett, a reluctant participant in God's work who may miss out on some of the blessing? Are we Deborah, a leader in God's work who overcame the weakness of being a woman in a male dominant society? Or are we Jail, someone who boldly obeys going God's uh, leading even if we don't have a lot of time to think about what we're planning? Or are we the 10,000 men in Barrett's army? We can charge for God, even if we don't have a weapon to fight the battle because we trust Him. Who are we? We need to be available and responsive to His word and when He calls for action. And remember, we can't be confident in His plan because uh, we we can be confident in His plan not because we understand it, but because it's God's plan. I think that's where we're, when we when we get a plan from God or He tells us we need to do something, we need to. It's, it's a struggle sometimes because we don't know the outcome and as our human nature prevents us from believing that God will give us reconciliation, we just sit there and no, oh, I, I think I have a better plan. I think if I do this differently, I'll get a better outcome. We need to we need to trust in God. We need to give him all of it and say, Lord, you have a better plan for me in my life. I'm just gonna follow your plan. And that's where we're going to leave that today. Uh, homework for next week. Judges 6, 1 through 8, and 32. Here we're going to identify the four steps of the cycle in this passage. What does the story of Gideon in chapter 6 teach us about knowing the will of God? How does God test Gideon's faith in chapter 7? How does God test our faith today? And why does God test the faith of believers? I will be leaving this Friday. We're going away for a week. We'll be back. Uh, <laughs> no, we're leaving Friday for a trip to Disney for the family. And uh, so, my father will be teaching. Sunday and follow so, Give him your ear. I didn't have a, I'm going to miss it. I kept blind on discipline. I never had a
Oh, what was it? The number two? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was Jacob. Okay. Did I press it? Are you going to sit there and do, uh, do that for me when you're down there? Yeah. <laughs> 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 